promise, but at least I can try. If you don't ask, you don't know. Well, welcome. We are week six. I do apologize for my voice. I just got approval for my infusion. I'm trying to get it tomorrow. I mean, that's how much rheumatoid arthritis affects you. Now, usually it's not a voice box. Usually it's your fingers, your joints, your elbows, knees, hips. Well, yeah, I've got that too, but my rheumatologist has never seen it before. But he now believes me that, yes, it is a part of what he needs to look for. In fact, he had to look it up when I told him. So I'm trying to get it in to get it done. It's all about insurance and authorizations. And you're going to understand that as you get into nursing and you're going to hear the stories of woe. And I'm sure you have your own stories of stuff you had to get done. So I'm a little squeaky, but um, I hope you can understand me well. If you don't, please stop me and I'll try to explain it in a different way. Or maybe my voice will get better miraculously. So this week we're going over hematology and immunologic dysfunction. And then we're going to hit some children with cancer. Your case studies for ALL has opened. And remember to turn in congenital heart defects and cystic fibrosis by Sunday, okay? You also have NCLEX questions, and we will be doing quiz four when we're done. It is on this week's material. And honestly, I think it's an easier test than the last two ones. So I know that they've been hard on you. Uh, we are looking at them. I know even last week's quiz, um, when we meet to do the um, item analysis on the exam, we'll be looking at that. I think some of you seen some changes in your quiz two grade. Some did, some didn't, okay? Depended on the questions you had. So again, I'm fighting for you. Um, and I know uh, when something's not fair, I'm not going to leave a question there just because it was there. I will make sure that you get the points back that you deserve because the question wasn't well written or whatever. So we're going to do our PowerPoint and then we're going to do our cahoots. Our cahoots, I believe, is 50 questions this time. Next week, we're going to be doing an exam. Uh, remember, try to get in a little earlier so that we can get everybody looked at, all your IDs done, and that we can um, get started by five after. And if we do that, then I can start class at 420. Um, again, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do the PowerPoint for you this time. And my other class, I'll do the cahoots. Again, I'll send them both. And you'll be able to have both parts of the lectures. All the same thing, but I know that you like to test yourself with the cahoots. So after class, if you have that time, go to the uh, thing. It should um, by Wednesday, that will be posted and you can look at the cahoots and all the concepts that you um, need to look at. So any questions? I'm doing my review on Thursday at 2 p.m. If anybody's available, that's Eastern Standard Time. And again, I'll get that posted up by four or five o'clock in the afternoon because I know that y'all want to see it as soon as I do it. So I will be posting that. You already got the uh, PowerPoint study guide. So you've been having that since last week. We got it out a little earlier at a request to, from some of the students. And we're almost done with exam three uh, review. So I'll get that out as soon as we can. I know you like to work ahead and those things make you under, you know, you have that repetition of looking and thinking about it. And then maybe coming to class and then hearing about it. So let's go and let's start. <clears throat> so we're starting with hematology and then we're going to go to immunology. And remember, this is about a child. Now, many of these conditions can be also adults and you can apply it that way. When they can, I will let you know, because I've search to MPs, they're sort of hand in hand right now with some of the same concepts. So again, you don't understand something, stop me, and I'll try to explain you. Remember, I've done adults and children, so I've got the view of both sides of, of the uh, coin here. 
So, okay, you have a hematological or immunologic dysfunction, means you're weak, you're tired, you're always getting sick, something's going on. Um, we need to do something to find out why. And the simplest thing to do with hematology and immunology is just a complete blood count. I mean, we look at the white blood cells, we see, are they elevated? Do we have an infection or are they low, you know, uh, which causes other problems? Um, we also can look at the platelet counts, very important. Um, and then we just need to hear from the mother, from the child, what's going on. Most parents bring their children in at this point because there's no energy. They look pale, they're tired, they're just not what they used to be. So they're really concerned. Something's wrong. So what basically it is, is when you have um, a hematological problem, many times it's anemia. That's the biggest thing. So anemia is when your red blood cells, you don't have enough. Well, the function of red blood cells is to carry oxygen and nutrients to the cells. So if you don't have red blood cells, oxygen isn't getting there and or also nutrition to the cells. So the cells say, hey, I'm tired. I don't got oxygen. I don't got food. I'm just going to be lazy. And that is that lack of oxygen is that that lack of energy that you see in children because there's nothing to feed the body, make it work. We know sometimes as a kid gets older, they um, have a thing where they don't have enough iron in their um, diets. We know the newborn infant is born with just breast milk, but we give iron fortified formula and then we'll give vitamin D to those breastfed babies. And usually mom's um, iron stores are okay. But by the time about six months old, we start introducing food. We need to think of those foods that have iron in it. Now you get a kid who's always infection, have infections, always bleeding. Again, that complete blood count is going to tell you what's going on. You know, frequent infections, I mean, upper respiratories are normal, but if it goes beyond that, what's happening? And we need to find out. So red blood cell disorders, most common of all, as I said, is anemia, which means your hemoglobin hematocrit your red blood cells, there's not enough. And you don't have enough red cells, you have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. So, I mean, that would be a great nursing diagnosis, right? Part of why, you know, you have no energy because you don't have red blood cells. Um, there are some type of anemias where the hemoglobin um, and the red blood cells either are shaped irregularly or they are um, burst quickly, they go away quickly, or they're irregularly shaped, um, and or that you're not producing. So all due to the red blood cells, these are anemias. So what they say in children, you know, adults may be a little different, but in children, they define a anemia as about a 10, 10 and 30, you know, Lower than that, they're considering that it could be anemic for children. Now, let's look at the type of anemias. Now, I said it could be not enough red blood cells, or you're losing them quick, or they're being destroyed quicker. So let's look at the first is nutritional. Well, most common is iron deficient anemia. Common thing. How do we treat it? Well, we replace the iron in the diet or we give iron to that child or to that adult, doesn't matter, it's the way we treat it. B12 is called the intrinsic factor, has to do, um, you don't have enough B12, you're not gonna get the nutrition you need. Um, or how about those chronic, chronic nosebleeds, you know? Um, that could go into acute blood loss, right? Now, Again, symptoms, signs, you have them all up here, but I think the one that's mostly um, that you hear is that fatigue, you know, just no energy. Now, one of the most um, significant is when you have your bone marrow, doesn't produce red blood cells, and that's called aplastic anemia, you know, and this is all forms of, you know, your blood, there, there's, it's not being produced the way it should. We're going to go into that and I'll describe it to you more. 
um, acute lymphocytic leukemia and cancers can also cause bone marrow ca uh, failure. Now, acute blood loss. Well, when we think of somebody who cut and bleeds a lot, that's your hemophiliac. And that just means your blood doesn't have clotting factors, so it doesn't clot, you know, and you just keep bleeding, whether it's internal or external. This is something that they bleed, bleed. Many times you're going to see the diagnosis of either hemophilia or something called um, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, ITP. Remember, P means platelets. Idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, but P is platelets. It's a lack of platelets. Remember, platelets are part of that bleeding cascade that helps in the clotting of blood. So sometimes the way that we diagnose that is through nosebleeds. They're having chronic nosebleeds more than usual. Like, why is my kid getting, you know, two nosebleeds a month? Usually it's not just the upper respiratory, dry mucous membranes and in the nose. You know, we've tried putting the Vaseline there morning and night, but it's still, it's moist and we're still nosebleeds. So then we're going to go into the treatment of nosebleeds too. Then we go into the intercorpuscal type of um, anemias. And when we think of this one, this is your sickle cell. This is just a cell that's irregularly shaped and they die quickly. So uh, uh, not uncommon, sickle cell children have extremely low hemoglobin and hematocrit. Usually they come in for crisis, they're in pain. This is a big thing with sickle cell. Um, we also have to give them blood transfusions. Then you go on to the extra corpuscle, and that is usually due to some, you know, immunologic or a drug toxic event that's gone on. Um, it could be due to chemo and irradiation, which causes an increased blood cell uh, production. So we're going to go into these things and let's look at them some more. So first of all, anemia. Why is it bad besides there is no energy? Well, what happens is there is no, um, you know, cells in the vessel. They bounce off of each other instead of just going through the vessel, no problem. Um, it's what we call hemodiluted. There's more fluid than there is cells in the, the blood volume. Now, the first thing I would do when I would suspect an anemia, maybe a kid looks pale, you know, you look at their, their palms and their mouth and their tongue, and they're just looking pale in the sclera. You're like, hmm, let me listen to that heart. You will hear a murmur because of that swooshing of those cells going through those heart and through those valves. So you will hear that, okay? It's what we call that is turbulence because the cells are not holding it together as one. They're like bouncing all over. Now, the heart figures out, you know, I'm not getting enough oxygen to my body. So um, there's two things that happen, but the heart does one thing and it just says, let me just increase my heart rate, my beat. Let me, let me get that blood, those oxygen and nutrients to the cells. And it works and it works and it works. And, you know, when you do too much work, too much exercise, you're going to end up in some sort of failure, right? Well, that's what happens to the heart. You know, and then the heart doesn't work, and then you're going to fill up with fluids, go into congestive failure, all those things can occur. Well, no oxygen, there's going to be some cyanosis. You're not getting oxygen and nutrition to the cells. Well, you're going to have some re uh, growth retardation. A younger child with uh, an anemia, they don't get those blood cells up. They're not going to grow as, you know, like the other children. So how do we treat anemia? Well, Number one, we need to diagnose it again is through that history, that physical, looking at them, like looking at their, you know, sclera, looking at their mucous membranes. Is it pale? What is the, the, the look at the child? I mean, sometimes you have a darker skinned person, but you can still see white tongue, white gums. You can tell something's happening. You can look at the sclera and you could see they look pale. 
So um, that would be part of the history. And of course, the tired, et cetera. And the CBC, absolutely. Number one thing before we do anything. I mean, of course, they pull a bunch of other labs to go with it. But the CBC is the one that we are going to be the first to look at. So we could go ahead and transfuse an anemia all the time. But we need to figure out why. What happened? Is it nutritional? Is it some sort of condition where the cells are not made or they're destroyed quickly or they're irregularly shaped? We need to figure out what happened. And then you can go and try to intervene with that. And if they're still low and they're not, cells aren't building up or it's critically low, we're going to give blood to that child or even that adult. You know, we're going to give blood to replace it, to get the oxygen back to the, what the body needs. I mean, the brain and all the organs need oxygen to survive and to work efficiently. So you get a child in and they're anemic, the heart's working, there's poor blood volume. We are going to be giving IV fluids, but this is a concept to think about. You already have a very thin hemodiluted blood system. Now you give some, maybe a bolus of fluid. What's going to happen to that hemoglobin and hematocrit? It's going to go lower. So you got to be really careful with that, okay? And there's also controversy, do we give oxygen? You don't have cells. What's going to carry the oxygen, right? We do it because maybe you get the maximum that you could, but does it work? It's sort of controversial, okay? And again, you can watch that usually we'll start the IV, draw the labs, get the CBC out. We'll go ahead and give a bolus of fluid. That hematocrit is going to get lower. Look where you started at. If you at 6 and 18, I'm sure it's going to be 5 and 15 after a bolus of fluid. So be careful. So how do we as nurses treat that? Well, no oxygen, no energy. The body just needs the heart and the lungs and the organs to work, so bed rest. That means you're expending no energy. Get that child relaxed and quiet. So how are we going to manage this? Well, of course, we're going to look at the kid, the age, and that racial and ethnic background makes a difference. You know, African-American, we know sickle cell. That comes from there. Thalassemia, which we're going to go into, which is Cooley's anemia, is the Mediterranean people. So where they come from could make you a decision, hmm, these are things I need to look at. Again, a history and always rule out that we're not bleeding internally. Do a stool for occult blood. Because it could be just simple that you have a ulcer, could be, or some bleeding in the GI tract. Now, whenever we have a kid with anemia, they're going to get pinches and they're going to get blood drawn. So prepare them, you know, get on their level. You know, again, get below them. Don't let them look up at you on their developmental level. And I know that with blood draws in pediatrics, they are using a, a lot of numbing creams and gels, et cetera. So they don't even feel blood draw. They feel a touch, but there's no ouch with it. There's no pain. Because, I mean, this kid is already, you know, very anemic. So we don't want them screaming and yelling and going crazy for blood draw because I mean, sometimes you have to have four people hold them down. I mean, I've been there, you know, depending on that child's, you know, cognitive levels. I've seen it. So you're going to burn up oxygen needs like crazy. And this kid actually, depending on where that hemoglobin is, they could code and arrest and you'd be in a lot of troubles. So um, trying to make it as cold as possible. So iron deficient anemia, it's caused by not enough dietary iron. So what do we do? Well, I mentioned that we do have iron fortified formulas for infants that are not breastfed. But at six months, the first thing we give them is rice cereal. It is iron fortified. Every food we look at then is iron fortified. Now, premature infants, you know, there are special formulas. There are usually formula is 20 calories per ounce. That's usual. We have them up to 27, 30 calories per ounce. Extra calories, extra nutrients. There's all different things for the prematures. You know, iron deficient anemia, remember that pre-adolescent growth spurt? 
and how adolescents eat. They grab a, a you know, a some sort of powder bar and a water and run out of the house and they don't eat all day. Well, because of that, they can become anemic due to iron deficiency because they're not eating properly. Now, they used to call children that weren't give formula breast milk, they would just give whole milk to them. And that's the milk baby. Because remember, milk does not give iron. So we need to make sure children do get the iron. So if they are younger than a year, they need to be on an iron fortified something or iron in their food. You know, I was very lucky. Um, my grandson loves broccoli. To this day, he'll sit there and have a whole plate of broccoli and just eat it and just be a happy camper. You put a salad on his plate. That's what he prefers over food. Put it in his mouth. I mean, a kid is this big, you know, he's a stick, but at least he's eating his iron. He's got a lot of energy. He gets me tired out. So prognosis, iron deficient anemia is great, you know, diet or iron supplementation. Remember, if children get liquid iron, like you were taught in pharmacology, you should drink it through a straw, right? Because you don't want to stain the teeth. So remember that with it. So sickle cell anemia, we know it has to do with an irregularly shaped cell. We know that if both parents have a trait, a child has a 25% chance of having the disease. A trait does not mean they're sickle cell. It just means they can pass it on to their children. I know many parents have come to me and say, yeah, well, he has a sickle cell trait. <laughs> okay, well, that's for his children, that this child, his cells are fine. Now let's talk about sickle cell and what it is. Well, you have the, um, the bone marrow produces these red blood cells. They are in the shape of a sickle. They die quickly. They are regularly shaped and they go through the blood system. They get to a bifurcation in a blood vessel and one gets stuck and they can't get through. Usually this is, happens in a period of dehydration. The cells aren't dilated, so it can't get through. So the other cells behind it back up. So that area swells and it gets painful and it hurts. And below that area, there's no blood's going through. So you can have tissue necrosis, you know? So it is on both sides of the thing. So if you can imagine, this is all due to small cells, you know, which causes all of this local hypoxemia and cell death. So how are we gonna treat it? Well, number one, let's get those cells bigger, right? So well, how did the kid get there in the first place? How did they get to the point where all of a sudden they're in a crisis because the cells aren't going through the blood system? Well, we know that if a child is in activities that requires more oxygen, um, the body's gonna work harder so you have more chance of sickle cell factors especially if this is sports and they're not hydrating during the sports. Trauma always can be something, extra swelling in there. Again, blood vessels are smaller, those cells can't get through. Infection and fever, uh, that, isn't that like uh, you're losing fluid, fever, right? That's the uh, insensible water loss. And then of course, any stress, physical, emotional, you know, I had this one student through nursing school and almost every single semester she had a crisis. I mean, it's stressful. Nursing school is stressful. So um, it's hard sometimes to calm that down, but it's, you know, that's what happens. Now, what happens? Blood gets thicker, cells get smaller, and it's just due to whatever, the dehydration, due to fever, due to sports, due whatever. And again, it swells and then areas get hypoxic. So number one priority treatment for sickle cell is IV fluids. Now, what else dilates these vessels? Heat. So you're gonna say, well, isn't it the pain because it hurts bad? Well, again, you're treating the symptom, not the cause. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't have that morphine or Dilaudid or whatever I need in the other hand, but I'm going to start that IV bolus and I'm going to have a heat pack there for them and give that pain. But your priority is to get that IV fluid in. Bolus of fluid 
and then the heat dilates the vessel. And then what happens? All these little sickle cells all of a sudden start going through the vessels. And guess what? The pain will, you know, go away. I mean, there's still going to be the irritation, but the pain will go away. Now, another thing that happens is, you know, potassium, um, loss of potassium and electrolyte replacement. So when we're doing a sickle cell, kid comes in, known kid with sickle cell, complaining of knee pain, hip pain, chest pain. I mean, it could be anywhere, actually. Anywhere there's a blood vessel. Could be in the eye, could be in the head, could be anywhere. But they come in, we know they're sickle cell. You know, these uh, children, we're going to do a CBC and definitely we're going to do a chem profile. We want to look at those electrolytes, what's going on with them. And we'll replace them as they need them. Also, as I said, not uncommon. These kids come in with hemoglobin hematocrit of 5 and 15, 6 and 18. I'm talking low. And the emergency room, we're giving blood before they even go upstairs because now they're symptomatic. Heart rates are elevated. O2 sats are lower. Yes, we need to give them something right away. And many times, many times, these kids have low-grade um, fevers. And it's a sign of an infection somewhere. And we're not going to play around and think, is it viral? Is it bacterial? No, we're going to give antibiotics now um, because we need to support the body. This child's immunosuppressed. So they don't have a big immune system to work for them. Now, many children from ages two months to about five years until their immune system is working good will be given a prophylactic antibiotic. It's usually one dose of a penicillin, whether it's a liquid or a pill. Um, they're given it every um, day for up to five years old, okay? Also, we're going to be monitoring the reticulocyte count. We want to know how is that bone marrow functioning? Is it producing enough cells? And again, bone marrow trans, the blood transfusions, why do we give it? Well, we need to get oxygen and nutrients to the cells. So we give it as soon as we can see it. And it may reduce that ischemia. It's just like, do we put oxygen on these children or not? Does it work? Are there cells? Are they accepting more oxygen? So again, it's one of those things. Now, there is no cure. When you talk about children with sickle cell, it's something they have to learn to work with. Um, we know maybe a bone marrow transplantation will work, but remember, there's still that chance of rejection even with a bone marrow, okay? As I said, they're immunocompromised, so they're gonna have those frequent bacterial infections. And that is the leading cause of death in children um, with sickle cell. But you can live with sickle cell, keep yourself hydrated, keep yourself you know, from getting infections. I mean, just even good hand washing and wearing a mask if you're around people that are sick, right? So educating the family. As soon as you see a fever, these children need to be brought in, need to be treated right away. That's going to decrease the chances of dehydration due to insensible water loss, and it's going to help decrease those sickle cell crises because the blood's going to flow. Now, that immunosuppressed thing, we're going to be giving that penicillin as ordered. Now, the two type of strokes, that um, types of sickle cell crises that are like super emergency is how about a headache? You know, you have a child who has sickle cell complaining of a bad headache. Isn't that sickle cells blocked up in the head somewhere? Yes, that can happen. So it could be signs of stroke. They have a headache, you're gonna check neurovascular signs. You're gonna check neuro signs. You know, looking at pupils, um, seeing if they're responding, level of consciousness, you know, moving all extremities, really important. And the other one, respiratory. It's gonna look like a pulmonary embolus, right? Because again, sickling pain in the chest. Now, the one thing that we need in any diagnosis with children, I mean, adults even, treat them normally. You know, let them be able to participate in sports, but they need to know what they have to do. They need to hydrate and they need to rest. They don't need to be go, go, go the whole game, but they can participate as long as they you know, do what they have to do to take care of themselves. And that's going to help prevent that sickling.
Now I mentioned briefly, there is this Mediterranean Sea, right? Cultures, type the race of, of uh, people. Why would we want to know? Well, thalassemia. This is a rectangular shaped cell, okay? And what happens with this one is these burst. They don't keep around a lot. They're short life, poof, and they're gone. Now, there's four types of thalassemia, but usually when we think thalassemia, it's the major or Cooley's anemia. Now, we can't make blood cells produce their, they're there, they're rectangular, they're being produced normally, but they're dying quickly. So these kids do not hold a hemoglobin hematocrit. These will need uh, blood transfusions regularly to survive, okay? So the Mediterranean people, you hear they need blood transfusions, you know it's thalassemia. They're always on those spy movies. It was like that, you know, person, whatever. Um, and we know that where he is because he needs blood transfusions, let's find out where he's getting his source and we can go get him. You know, one of those type of movies. I've seen it in two movies already, and I know it's thalassemia. Now, thalassemia is, isn't usually seen in the first part of the infancy. It's usually in the second half. Now, the thing with, you know, children, infants, is their hemoglobin hematocrit will go low normally because their blood isn't making cells uh, yet. It takes a while. So they go from a you know, a normal hemoglobin hematocrit and it can drop to nine. And that's okay with infants, okay? Um, it's when that starts happening um, and we see them getting pale and even quicker than six months, that's when we'll do that CBC and we're gonna look at the cells and see what they look like. These children, at that point, they're gonna be severe anemia. I mean, that, you know, color the kids, the gums, the, the sclera. These are the assessment that a physician would see. This says, let's just do a CBC and see what's going on here. It's probably this. Also, you don't have oxygen. You don't have nutrients going to the cell. Guess what? You're not going to grow the way you should. So even a child who's not gaining the weight, who is not growing the way they should, you also are going to be checking that CBC, and many times they could catch this. Again, they're going to need blood transfusions regularly to survive. Now, one of the things that's different with thalassemia with anemia, remember I said their cells burst. Well, what is inside a red blood cell? Oxygen and iron. A lot of iron is being spewed into the bloodstream you can become toxic on the iron from the blood cells. So they're going to be needing medications to get that iron and to excrete it through the kidneys. Or they may, may, may need to have something called apheresis. It's like dialysis, but it's just to, re, to release certain toxins that are in the blood. And it's this little machine, looks very similar to dialysis. And they go on it for an hour, they get rid of the iron, and, you know, this could be done regularly on these children, too, because iron can cause a lot of mental problems, seizures, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we manage thalassemia? Well, transfusions and chelation therapy. Those are the two things. Now, this kid, you know, is going to be in and out, again, transfusions, you know, his, his life is pretty much into an outpatient center, getting all of these things that they need. You know, and they're going to be stuck all the time. Um, and these kids really need outlets. And the family, you know, they have a child who needs a lot of work. Um, and it is a chronic, chronic condition. So um, they need support. They, they need us to say, wow, you're doing a great job. And sometimes it's just saying, wow, you're doing a great job with him. He looks so good. You know, he hasn't been sick in a while. How do you do that? I mean, a parent who has a child like this is going to be appreciative that you said those things. And again, multiple, multiple blood transfusions, uh, there's a lot of problems. They could get different antibodies in their blood, become very hard to find blood. 
and then, you know, blood transfusion reactions too. So, and it's lifelong. It's nothing you can do really to take care of this. I mean, it might be a bone marrow transplant, but they really don't know yet. It's not been proven. So you've got a child whose blood cells are constantly bursting. So you have a low hemoglobin and a low hematocrit. The heart's going to be beating like crazy, right? Trying to make up for that low hemoglobin hematocrit. So heart disease. We want to take out the spleen a lot of times to stop the production of red blood cells. One of the things they do. And many times they end up in septic shock from the post uh, splenectomy. Also, multiple organ failure. Well, they're not getting the oxygen nutrition they need. So this could be causing those sort of things. So um, we have to look at, you know, the, the liver and, and the brain and everything is given the nutrients. Okay, here's another one. This one is called aplastic anemia. So there are two types literally, um, but it's basically the pancytopenia is all forms of the blood, the white blood cells, the red blood cells. And whenever you see thrombocytopenia, penia, P for platelets, low platelets. So you can see this child's gonna be bleeding, they're gonna be immunosuppressed, then they're gonna be no energy, no in hemoglobin there basically, okay? And then hypoplastic anemia is the red blood cells, but these ones have normal white blood cells and platelets. So it could be either way, but it is a depression of red blood cells either way. That means your body is not producing them. So the one thing about aplastic anemia is the body doesn't know what it's doing. It's acting almost like a cancer, okay? So we're definitely, this kid's definitely going to get blood transfusions. But what we try to do is to prevent, you know, um, to, to try to help the blood be informed in the body. We do immunosuppressive therapy and a bone marrow transplantation. And this is really similar to the treatment that you see with leukemia. So we're going to go into leukemia also later. So um, that's the way that we treat aplastic. But I think of it actually as you know, everything is depressed. The so white cells, red blood cells, and platelets, as everything's affected. So now let's look at those defects in hemostasis. So it's problem with bleeding. You know, why? Why are we bleeding and why? Well, the first thing we think of is hemophilia. Now, hemophilia is an x link recessive inheritable disease. So that mom passes it on to the children. Um, and there are different factors. It's not just hemophilia, it's one thing. There's factor eight, factor nine, von Willebrand's, and, you know, it or a combination. So the normal, the one that we think about, you know, hemophilia, most of them are that deficiency of the clotting factor eight. There is another one, B, which is the Christmas disease, they've given the name, and that's the deficiency of factor nine. And then there's what we call von Willebrand's disease. I just love that. Von Willebrand. Anyway, it was a scientist researcher who found that there was a factor in the blood that helped with clotting. And he gave his name to that factor but it's that and factor eight. I've seen a lot of kids come in with von Willebrand, believe it or not, probably more than hemophilia. You know, yeah, my child has von Willebrand disease. Well, I'm gonna now be worried about bleeding. So I'll be looking. So how do we diagnose this? Like I said earlier, sometimes it's those, you know, nosebleeds that bring them in. I see that a lot, especially for ITP. It's like there's something wrong. They don't know the kid's bleeding and it becomes so much the parent has to get medical assistance. But hemophilia, what do we look for? Well, of course, is there bleeding anywhere? You know, you know, is there a cut that's not healing? Um, it could be, has it been not diagnosed for a while? You know, or maybe there's bleeding in the stool somewhere. I mean, something could be going on. 
So we look for over prolonged bleeding. Um, blood in the joint, hemoarthrosis. Actually, this is what we need to prevent in hemophilia because it destroys the joints. And then these children end up in wheelchairs. So as much as possible, we want to protect the joints. And we can all see bruising everywhere. And they just keep bleeding underneath the skin in a big bruise. As I said, it is X-Link. And now what are we going to see when we draw the blood for hemophilia? You're going to see that factor is low, whatever the factor is, 8, 9, von Willebrand. You're going to see that low. But you know when we give heparin, the lab value we look at for bleeding times, it's that PTT or APTT. Well, in hemophilia, that factor with no heparin is going to be prolonged. So you're going to have elevated PTT lab values. But if you look at this in hemophilia, you're going to have normal platelets. And then there's parathyroid, uh, parathyroid hormone and the fibrinogen. These are other colliding factors, but the platelets is what I look at. I'm like, oh, they're normal. And look, PTT is elevated. And then the factors take a week to get back, you know, the lab values. So how do we treat hemophilia? Well, you have a kid, fell down. You see the knee is bruising, that joint's filling up with blood, you know, and what's great about this is they can do these things at home. What they'll do is they will, number one, what do you do when you fall normally? You sprain your ankle. You do rice, right? You rest, you ice, you contain, and you elevate. Well, we're going to do that for the hemophilia to stop the bleeding as much as possible but they're gonna be doing a home infusion. Let me tell you a little story about a nine-year-old boy that came in with his father, and I was so impressed. Came in, it was a Saturday, they couldn't get a hold of their hematologist, the kid had fallen, and he didn't know if he should give the factor or not, because he had had one maybe a week or so earlier. So came into the ER and we said, yeah, you can do it. Well, I was orienting a brand new nurse. I mean, brand into nursing too, into the ER. And the father said, do you mind if I do this? And I said, no, but do you mind if we watch? So I watched him go wash his hands, put his gloves on, open it up. The son and him sat there and determined, all right, this is the vein we want to use. Okay. And the son held the arm. The father, unbelievable technique, got a little butterfly needle in. The son held it. He had it all mixed up in a little tubing, and he slowly pushed it in, pulled it out, put a band-aid on. The kid was happy. The father was happy. Probably as good as technique as I do. And my poor brand new nurse was like blown away. The father did that. And I'm like, it can be done. They can be taught. You know, it's their child. They don't want to always have to run to a doctor's office or an ER or something for it. So that was actually a great experience that I, I was able to watch. Now, sometimes you have a mild hemophilia and you can use desmopressin. Well, we're going to find out was it next week. That's used for diabetes insipidus also but we use it for hemophilia also, and it does help with the bleeding. And then there's amniotic caproic acid. It's another thing that could be added on. So there we are. You, something happens, you're gonna you know, protect yourself, number one. I mean, kids with hemophilia, think of a toddler and think about them running around the house. Think about all those sharp corners on coffee tables and tables and et cetera. These kids need a protected environment. You're going to be patting that coffee table and, pack and, and patting those sharp areas so that if they hit it, because that's what toddlers do, and even preschoolers, you know, they're more apt to get injured, you know, that these children are protected. Now, what if they do get cut? And now they are bleeding. So again, you rest it, you ice it, you compress it, and you elevate it. So get an ace bandage wherever it is. Another, that's, that's what we are with the safe environment there. You know, good dental hygiene, you know, making sure that the teeth are clean, you know, and flossing, but you don't do it so aggressively that you cause bleeding there. So again, 
We don't want that child to bleed into those joints and it can cause crippling. You know, these kids have to live a lifetime with it. And we want these children to be up and walking because they will end up in wheelchairs if we don't take care of it. So that's limiting the joint damage because they do live a pretty normal life. Yeah, there's gene therapy going on. It's not completely there, um, but you know, it, it is, it's very close. So ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. Everybody said P, platelets. This is a low platelets. Your platelets are destroyed and they're always destroyed. And as much as you're producing them, they're going away, okay? You've got platelets, but, you know, they're being, they're immature and, and they're, you know, also um, in, not available for clotting. ITP can be chronic or it could be an acute, which means what? Well, sometimes children, they just had like some upper respiratory, strep throat, some infection upper in here. And these children, oh, a month later or so, all of a sudden will get this rash. You see that little purplish rash? Usually I see it on the legs. I just couldn't find a picture with the legs. And the mother's like, the kid doesn't go outside. He doesn't play ball. He's always on video games and he's got bruises like crazy. So I don't understand. That's usually what brings them in, that bruising. Or it could be that, again, that nosebleed. So that's usually what we see. Now, we can treat it and we can get it to go away. If we get it cured and stopped, the platelets become normal within one year of it starting. Now, usually it's quicker than that, but they say up to a year. After a year, it's just going to be a chronic condition where their platelets aren't going to be working the way they should. How do we treat it? Well, we're going to be given IV immunoglobins and we're going to be giving anti-D antibody. Now, you got a kid in the hospital, you got an adult in the hospital and they have ITP, okay? Well, we're going to worry about no low platelets. So hmm, low platelets, what's that concern? Oh, that's bleeding. They, they can't stop bleeding. So. You're not going to stick a needle in that, that person if you don't have to, because if you put an IM injection, it's going to cause a hematoma. If you need to start an IV, you got to, but you're trying to do it as little, least as possible, okay? Also, you're going to be looking at the gums bleeding. You're going to look for rectal bleeding, uh, bleeding in the urine, bleeding ecchymosis anywhere. And in the hospital, we will be able to monitor that CBC and that platelet count. If we see the platelets going down, we know that it's, nothing's happening yet. We're still in acute ITP. Sometimes with the IVIG, the IV immunoglobins and anti-D antibody, they'll add corticosteroids sometimes, okay? So basically ITP, just monitor them for bleeding and you don't do anything that causes more bleeding. So epistaxis, it's gonna be on one of your case studies, trust me, you're gonna see it. So epistaxis, nosebleed, you know, how do we treat it? You know, there's been so many things that have been said. Well, think about your bleeding and it's putting blood, it's going down, it's gonna go into your stomach. And of course you'll vomit if all this blood, you know, goes in the stomach. So you take your two fingers, you pinch and you lean forward. And hopefully any blood will come out your mouth. So you're not swallowing it. And you need to keep that pressure on for 10 minutes. If the bleeding continues after 10 minutes, they say you need to get help. So you need to go to urgent care, ER, the physician, wherever. And there's all different things you can do to help it. Uh, I think the one thing uh, which uh, I've seen the most is they put what we call nasal tampons, which are look like a tampon and it causes pressure and it will hold whatever's bleeding in there and it will help stop it. It's like a finger on, on a sore that's bleeding. So that's how you do it. Pinch it, thumb, first finger, bent over, 10 minutes. Don't go away. You're going to go um, seek help.
Now, HIV AIDS, we're talking about a baby being born from a mother who had HIV. I mean, adults, we know that's risky behavior in teaching them to be safe sex. Well, that's part of adolescence. Now, infants, they have no choice. They're born with it. Well, some mothers um, do go and they start what we call heart therapy, which is a highly active antiretroviral therapy. And they start at about 22 weeks of gestation. And the goal of giving this antiretroviral therapy, okay, is to improve that newborn's immune function. You know, antibiotics aren't gonna do anything. This is a virus. So we need to improve their immune system. Think about a newborn when they're born. Do they have an immune system? No. So every little thing that we can give them can improve it. All right. So what are things that we do see? I mean, in care management, again, goal is to improve their immune system. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in the respiratory system is pneumocystic carney pneumonia, PCP pneumonia. It's the most common opportunistic infection of children. And these infants between three to six months is when you'll see it. Another one you might see is yeast, you know? Ever see that little white tongue that you try to scrape it, it doesn't come off? Well, that's going to be a yeast infection. Now, I want you to know that children born with HIV that get some antivirals as soon as possible, I have seen children convert to no HIV, no AIDS. I have met three girls, they're triplets. One is AIDS, one is HIV, and one doesn't have anything. Why the difference? I'm not sure, but you can see not all children born of an HIV mother will end up with HIV AIDS, okay? So we know that all of this stuff is, you know, uh, education and um, trying not to get pregnant, HIV, but, you know, there's, there's always a choice. It's a, you know, a mother's choice. So talking about, you know, what do we do? And we know that part of hematology is, like I said, giving blood transfusions. Now, if it's ITP, the idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, we don't have platelets. We only get platelets for that, which is cool. You don't have to give the whole blood volume, but just a, a little, a little, little, maybe 50 mLs. We give that to the, the baby. And that is all the platelets they do need. So any blood component we give, FFP, uh, platelets, um, you know, whole blood, um, pack cells. Remember, we need to look for transfusion reactions and we need to deliver it according to the policy of the hospital. I mean, most of the time we know it's a double check by a nurse. We know that, um, that you're gonna do vital signs before 15 minutes thereafter, and then every hour following that. And you have to get that volume of blood, that container in four hours must be infused. What's not infused needs to go back down to the blood bank. So when we use a uh, infusion pump, remember if we see any reaction and it could be a rash, could be difficulty in breathing, or it could be a fever. A fever is probably the most common of all of them. You take a temperature and it's normal. 15 minutes later, it's 101. Turn that blood off. Don't flush the tubing in the child. Go right down to the hub and change it out. And um, that, and of course, call the physician and they'll be ordering whatever medicine that they should be able to do. I mentioned that apheresis, right? So apheresis, again, get rid of that iron for that thalassemia. Um, sometimes we can go in and get a blood specimen for just platelets by just removing those platelets and to give it to those children who do need that. Many times we go in and evaluate a hematological condition by doing a bone marrow aspiration. Now, if you've ever seen one, you're going to hear a <laughs> when they get into the bone, whether it's the chest or the, the hip bone, and it hurts, okay? Please, if you're with children, let them know that it will hurt. 
but you will give them as much medicine as you possibly can. They'll numb the outside and they'll go in with a needle and they'll numb the inside with numbing stuff before they do this punch and this crunch as I call it. So, but there is still some pain there. So please let them know, be honest. So if both parents have a sickle cell trait, what is the chance that a child will be born with sickle cell anemia? Okay. 25%, yes it is, thank you. Neoplastic disorders, you know, most of the time we talk about blood forming things, it's leukemias and it's lymphomas, okay? Leukemias, you know, I like this saying here, an unrestricted proliferation of immature white blood cells in the blood forming tissues, which means that the white blood cells are born, but they're immature. They don't work. They're like worthless. It doesn't work, okay? So you don't have white blood cells that don't work. You can understand that immune stuff and infection that can go on. So, I have actually seen a lot of very young kids get it. More frequent in boys greater than one, and it's between two to five is that peak onset. And today, survivability is really good, okay? But these children go through a lot trying to get there. So besides getting leukemia, remember liver and spleen, also are affected. But I mean, that saying right there tells you exactly what leukemia is. So how do we figure it out? Well, I had a next door neighbor. She was actually 14, I believe, when she was diagnosed. I found out she went to the ER complaining of knee pain, bruising, and just really fatigued, like tired, not her normal self. So when they heard that, they're like, hmm. And they did a, what, um, just a CBC. That CBC showed that there was a very low white blood cell count. Her initial white blood cell, remember normal is like five to 10, something like that, was 0 0.1. Now, there's two types of cells. There's acute lymphocytic leukemia and acute myelitic uh, leukemia, AML, ALL. ALL is the easier one to treat, okay? AML is the one that's more difficult to get rid of, okay? So you figured out now, you see that there are immature white cells, uh, the count's low, uh, be ready, we're gonna do a lumbar puncture, why? Well, we want to see is it in the central nervous system. We need to find out where is all this leukemia, where are these cells, so that they can treat these children properly. Again, that bone marrow is going to hurt. Let them know, because uh, I would want to know if it was me. Now, you get a kid diagnosed, you know, they've done their um, cerebral spinal fluid, and they've seen what they needed to see. Um, usually they'll put in a port because this is going to be a year or two of treatment and they don't need to be starting pinching this kid for IVs over and over again. And the children learn how to put that Emla cream on that area before they come in um, so that it's nice and numb when we have to open the port and get our blood. Now, there's four phases of therapy. The first phase is basically you're eradicating everything, Okay. It's the induction therapy is four to six weeks and the goal is remission. So in four to six weeks, you're cured, right? No, not completely. They need to treat the central nervous system and then they do this intensification. There's always going to be some cells left somewhere. They're the little sneaky little cells that you need to go and look for. And that's called the consolidation therapy. And that's to go in to find them and to kill them off. But the first four to six weeks, it's intense. They, they give chemo and most of those cells are gone. So it's achieving remission at that point. Now, once we think we got all those sneaky little cells and they're gone, 
then they put them on maintenance therapy. And depending on the cancer, the doctor, et cetera, they will keep them on that just to preserve their remission. You know, it could be a year, six months. It all depends on the child and the doctor, as I said. So, all right. When we look at leukemia, we know a hemopoietic stem cell transplant can be a cure for leukemia. We the one thing about this type of infusion, it's not like you have to have a blood type that's yours. You don't have to have O positive, A positive. Um, it could be matched or mismatched. That doesn't matter. Okay. There's two types of stem cell transplants. Well, autologous automatically mine. Auto mine. I somehow, maybe I was an infant and I gave my umbilical cord blood and mommy stored it for me. Well, that's my stem cells right there. Automatically mine, automatically number one to be given. Okay. Sometimes, you know, it's expensive. Not everybody does it. They don't have their own stem cells. So they go from somewhere else. Um, they most, if they have a sibling, of course, that's going to be the next choice. But allergenic is a donor, whether it's a sibling or it is not, um, is something that is um, the, the other type. So on, automatically mine, autologous, allergenic, somebody else. As I said, bone marrow, hemopoietic stem cells, there's always chance for, you know, rejection on them. And with rejection comes a lot of organ damage. So care management, well, it's long-term. It's gonna be lasting a while. Remember my kid that I told you, she had knee pain, she was in pain. So get them prepared for all procedures, be honest, because it's gonna happen over and over and over and over again. And you don't want these poor kids, you know, this first didn't tell them it was hurting and, you know, crying. And, you know, these kids just wanna be normal kids and parents, they just want to be done with the treatment. They want the kid to get back to normal too. So prepare both of them as well as we can. Relieve the pain and remember these kids have no white cells, okay? So infection is very high on the list of things that happen. You get a temperature of 100.5. Any immunosuppressed kids are told to get to their doctor to get on prophylactic antibiotics. So sickle cell, this is also leukemia, same thing. They need to come in, I'll call up the doctor. My kid has a fever of 100.6. They're gonna order antibiotics and you know to prevent them from getting really bad sepsis and infections. You're being given all of this chemo. So your blood counts are gonna be low and you're gonna be anemic. And with all of that, your platelets are low also, there are chances of bleeding. Again, um, chemotherapy is, uh, you need to be certified in it. Actually, this is an incredible field to go into. If any of you want to be a traveler, get into pediatric oncology and become chemo certified. Many hospitals will pay you like $20,000 sign on bonuses. That's what this field does. I mean, it's hard working with kids with cancer. Yes. But any kid, you know, has the chances of dying. It's not that they died or they lived. What did you give them while they were alive? I mean, I've had many uh, patients, you know, children die on me and I've cried and it's okay. But I gave my all to that child. And that's all that I can say that, you know, I couldn't have done anything more. I gave that family and I gave that child what I could. But it is a great profession. So determining the prognosis. Now, what kids make it and what kids really have a hard time? Well, what was your white count when you came in? Was it 0 0.1 or was it 0 0.01? That makes a big difference. Is it means it a 10 or is it 100? I mean, the difference in cells. How old were they? And was it the ALL or was it AML? Boys and girls. And this karyotype. Like if you have a very rare blood type, you're not going to get the blood and, and the blood components you need when you need them. It might be hard time to find them. So that makes a difference. So now let's look at some cancers, okay? So 
cancer, you think of cancer and what is treatment? Well, treatment is a whole bunch of stuff all combined. And, you know, they've done a lot of work on what is the best treatment for who. They have surgery, they have chemotherapy, radiation therapy, all combinations. Again, it is from trained nurses. Only trained nurses can work with chemotherapy. So the thing about cancer is how quick did we catch it? You know, the good thing about my neighbor, um, they caught it quick and these parents brought her in quick and they were devastated. In fact, I was crying with mom because it was my neighbor. I mean, we cared, we would share cups of sugar, you know, it was that sort of neighbor. I'd have the kids over baking cookies and doing Easter eggs with me. And, and they were Korean, so they didn't understand what Easter was as much as we did. And you know, very close and it was hard. So, but she got them in quick and she did very well. In fact, today, this girl is a PhD in psychology from the University of Miami. So it didn't affect her mentality at all. That was the outcome of that girl. But she came in with what? Pain in her knee. Um, she, yeah, she actually had a low grade fever and she had bruising. She didn't have petechial or spontaneous bleeding, but that's part of it. But she was tired. Um, weight loss, general malaise, anemia. And sometimes you get vision changes also. Um, so seeing these things, these kids should go in and check them out, see what's going on. So we know when we are treating cancer, we're not just treating cancer cells. I mean, we're gonna kill off good cells too. So how do we know which child's gonna be more at risk for going into septic shock? Because remember cancer is white, now, red blood cells, platelets down. I mean, you've got to say, hmm, which one am I going to be most concerned about? Well, they'll be doing CBCs, and I want you to start looking at the neutrophil counts. Neutrophil counts are showing you how much white blood cells are there to help fight infections. Usually they're 1,200, 2,000. It's pretty good. If you see a or 500, this child is at high risk for sepsis and septic shock. They don't have an immune system. So looking at that neutrophil count, I mean, many questions come up on the board, you know, on your NCLEX and your HESI talks about you got, what's your priority treatment? What child am I going to look at first? I don't care what the kid has. If they have a neutrophil count of 500, that kid is going to get sicker quick because there is no immune system for whatever reason, okay? We're also gonna, if we're looking at preventing septic shock, making sure we get the cultures and making sure that they're placed on appropriate antibiotic therapies. And, you know, remember, one thing we can do for children with these uh, altered immune system, wash your hands. Okay, hand washing is huge, you know, and teaching who visits hand washing because prevention of infection is your number one thing. These kids get an infection, they could die. They could die quick because they don't have an immune system. They can hemorrhage because all of those different sort of blood cells are going, you know, your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, your platelets, gone, okay? Again, they can get transfusions, whether it's blood, whether it's platelets. But these children, you remember, they're still kids. I mean, these sometimes are three or four year old kids, boys, right? That's usually the one. They want to go out and ride their bike and they can fall uh, or they're climbing and, and they dive bomb, hit their head. They can bleed in their brains and, you know, cause all different things. So, again, teach them to be safe. Again, you're going to be protecting your house, too, from the, for these children also. Remember, anemia and that beginning induction therapy, our goal is remission, right? So we're hitting them with I don't know how many chemotherapies. Remember, they're killing good cells, too. So their hemoglobin hematocrits will be low. These kids will tire easily. So remember that they do have... Um, the decreased tolerance to any sort of physical activity. You know, you think of chemo, you think of nausea, vomiting, right? You think these kids are all nauseous. So it can be pretty horrible, especially if they're on two or three different types of therapy. 
you know, years ago, believe it or not, when I first started nursing, you didn't give an anti-emetic until they vomited. Well, we've learned something in, through the years. And we said, why are we waiting? We know these kids are going to get sick. They're going to get nauseous. Let's give it before it happens. Because just like pain control, nausea control is better if we start before it happens. They're using cannabinoids quite a bit in children today. It's getting more and more well accepted. And of course, it depends on your state where you live in, et cetera. But it is being used. You know, I've seen a couple you know, of these um, documentaries and how they're using it with, you know, cancers and the nausea or in seizures, et cetera. It's something that's been working well, if given appropriately, with medical care, with the knowledge of the physician. That's the if, if, ifs on that. They're not going to eat. Their mouths are going to be swollen. They're going to be full of sores. They're nauseous. Uh, and take uh, nutrition, nutrition. Where's my nutrition, right? So we need to make sure that they're getting enough nutrition. And we always know height and weight is the first telltale sign of nutrition. If you're not gaining weight, you're not, or losing weight, or you're not getting taller, you're not getting nutrition because that's what's going to be affected, right? So we need to make sure that these children get a high protein, high calorie, and all the fat you can throw in there because the smaller amounts of food will be more packed full of nutrition that they do need. And whatever they want to eat, give it to them. As I said, their mouths are going to be horrible, but it's mouth to anus. All inside GI tract can be pretty horrible. So remember, um, it can be your rectum, uh, your anus can be all swollen. There's all different things we can do. Um, and, you know, keeping your, your mouth clean and um, mouthwashes. You know, they said avoid viscous lidocaine. Well, if you numb the mouth because it hurts, you're numbing also your gag reflex and you can aspirate fluids, et cetera. That's why they have to limit that. And neurological problems. You know, some of these kids um, end up with severe constipation. They're not eating good. They're on pain medicines because they're in pain. They're constipated, right? So what do you do when you're constipated and you feel like you have to have a bowel movement? you push down. What happens? You're in risk for bleeding. You push down, you're going to have neurological problems, right? Push down and poof, you can bleed into your head. So remember those things. A lot of these kids end up that they really can't move, they're on bed rest. So all the things that happen to adults, foot drop, you know, weakness, et cetera, be careful with. And then jaw pain is one of the things. So again, making sure we offer the medicines as we need it. They can have hemorrhagic cystitis, again, trying to get enough fluid in these kids, and then hair loss is a big thing. You know, the one thing that I did, and it's not necessarily for cancer kids, I did it for all my children, especially girls, you know, they can't wash their hair in the hospital. I'll have a bunch of little ribbons, and every day I'd go to, you know, work and I'd say, okay, what color are we doing today? And I had like, you know, 20 different whatever ribbons. And then they put one, a little bow around their head with a little bow or maybe two different colors in. And I would do the same thing. And me and that, my little patient would have little bows and ribbons in her hair. And they used it also on the cancer floor, something that I developed I just like kids looking like kids you know especially if they're an open heart and in CPS and they on the lung machine you know you need like a little bow to make the little girl looks like a little girl and it helps but um putting a bow on their head because they're bald I mean you've seen dads and brothers shave their heads all of these things for alopecia many times they put them on steroids remember steroids do have side effects I mean, I know because steroids make me look like the Pillsbury Doughboy too, you know, and it's uh, some of the kids will be very embarrassed. So make sure that their clothes aren't tight and snug and, you know, they have to pinch and move it. So make it bigger so that they can not feel so confined by this puffy feeling. Okay. And of course, salt, be careful with salt and fluid on these steroids. Remember these uh, procedures, to be honest, absolutely. 
Many of them will do today under some sort of sedation, conscious sedation. Um, it doesn't mean that they'll wake up and the things don't hurt a little bit, but it's really, um, we've progressed a long way. We're, we're not as barbaric, believe it or not, as we used to be. So we're doing um, all sorts of topical anesthetics. We're doing deep um, lidocaine for those bone marrows. Everything we can do to help that child tolerate it better. Again, use pain medicine. Don't let it go too far. Remember, it's just not morphine. It could be Tylenol in between. And remember, maybe it's a hot pack. Maybe it's a cold pack. Maybe it's just holding the child. Maybe it's positioning, rubbing their butt. Whatever it is, make sure that we are taking care. Distraction. Put on music. Put on the TV. Give them coloring. It all works in working together. Now, two types of lymphoma. Okay? Now. What are the differences? Hodgkin's neck up, big, non-tender lymph nodes. Non-Hodgkin's is everywhere and it's diffuse and you really can't see it, okay? You're gonna be X that, I'm warning you already. Hodgkin's is again, lymph nodes. You usually see like a huge lymph node in the upper neck. You see that thing there? And you're like, does it hurt? No, it's just there. But, you know, so big, they bring him in like, what's going on? I guess maybe he has an infection in his neck. Well, they look at it. It's painless, enlarged cervical, supraclavicular. As I said, from the shoulders up. They might have a cough because it's swelling onto the trachea, right? And you might see fever, anorexia, weight loss. What do we do to figure this thing out? Well, of course, your history. We'll do your CBC. We'll do CRP and a sedrate, the ESR. CRP and an ESR show inflammation. They're inflammatory factors. It shows there's somewhere in the body there's an inflammation going on. You see that in rheumatoid arthritis and you see that in juvenile idiopathic arthritis, lupus, inflammations going on. Great uh, sort of inflammatory factors. But what gives that final diagnosis, that big thing, you got this big lymph node, they're gonna do a biopsy and they're gonna see sternberg reed cells in there. You see them, you know it's Hodgkin's disease. Remember Hodgkin's is just big lymph nodes. Non-Hodgkin's it's all over the place. You can barely see it. Radiation, chemo, they do really well. Um, one of the problems with Hodgkin's it is a high risk for infertility. That is one of the biggest, you can get cured from it, but you know, can you imagine a young woman and now I can't get pregnant? So that could be you know, devastating. As I said, non-Hodgkin's, if you look, it's pieces of it all over the place and you don't really see these swollen anything, okay? So it's diffuse, all right? We're going to try to find a place to do a biopsy, you know, doing these uh, x-rays, bone scans, et cetera, try to find out what's going on. They do bone marrow aspiration on this one uh, to try to find the cells. This is an extremely aggressive cancer. So irradiation, chemo, again, going through all the stages of chemotherapy, induction, goal of remission, right? then you kill all the other cells that are left and then maintenance until they're done. Um, and remember, it's all of those side effects of chemo, just like I said earlier. Now, brain tumors are the most common of all solid tumors in children. It doesn't have to be cancerous, so it be benign or malignant. Now, what do you see with a brain tumor in a kid? Signs and symptoms. Well, you usually see vomiting, that is not related to eating. It didn't matter if they just ate or not, okay? So it's just vomiting that gets worse. Headaches that gets worse and can even wake them up at night. Those are the two symptoms of it. So we're gonna do radiation, chemo, shrink it, and then we're gonna do surgery. And they do have big incision marks like that head right there. It's absolutely something to be prepared for. Remember, they could have brain drains in there. They could have interventricular monitoring devices. Get that family prepared because things coming out of the head are really scary to families and visitors, okay? 
One of the things about brain tumors is they've taken a piece out of the head. It means that sometimes that piece is taken out and there's a hole left. So do you lay them on that side or you lay them on the other side? Because it can shift the brain around until the brain gets accustomed to that little piece that's missing, okay? So positioning, what does the doctor want? Do we lift the head up? Do we keep it down? Do we put them on the right side, left side? That's all going to be ordered. Fluid restriction imperative to be really following it. Too much intake can cause swelling and pressure on the brain. You don't want to do that, okay? And then, of course, once we're done with surgery or healing, get them back to where they can be. Some of them, you know, they don't have any sort of... Um, things that happen, but some of them will require, you know, some sort of rehabilitation after. Now, one of the cancers, not common, but it's always mentioned somewhere, okay? It's a neuroblastoma. It starts out with a mass in the abdomen, and it's this little mass that goes bigger and crosses the midline. And by the time it crosses the midline, it's already in the head. So by the time you diagnose neuroblastoma, this neuros is in the head, but it starts in the abdomen, they're already metastasized. Outcome's not great. What you usually will see with these kids is, I mean, this little baby down there is an extreme picture, but you can feel the mass in the abdomen, okay? You can feel there's a hard something going on there. It pushes up against the respiratory. So it causes problem with breathing. Um, masses in the um, head can cause periorbital edema. The eyes can pop out a little bit. There's a little bruising, all of these things. So this child's going to need a lot of um, help with, that, uh, with the parents and with the child. It's going to be uh, post-op, you know, complications. Are they going to do, are they going to do surgery? How much of the metastasis? How big is that neuroblastoma? Of what's going on? It is not a, um, not a uh, common at all. Thank goodness. And then osteosarcoma. Let's look at that one. Osteo means bone. So osteosarcoma or bone tumors, usually, what do you see? You see a kid who is limping and the kid, uh, you'll see it, it's in, usually in the femur is the most common of all the places. And it will get worse and worse, the pain and the pain. And it gets to the point where they lose weight, they get sick and they're getting anemic. And now you're seeing inflammation. Do an x-ray, you might see that fuzzy little piece on the x-ray. X-ray, see a CAT scan, MRI, do a biopsy. So we take a biopsy, we find out it is an osteosarcoma. These are your young adolescents, a lot of boys, okay? Like ages uh, 13 to 15, 12 to 15, that, that young age there. So how do we treat it? It's the femur bone. The whole femur bone's got to come out. So you have nothing but a hip socket left. Where are you going to put a prosthesis? So what they're doing today is they're salvaging the lower leg. And they're picking it up and attaching it inside that hip socket. Do you see that bottom picture on the left with the red shirt? The foot is actually facing backwards. And that foot that's there will help put somewhere to put a prosthesis so this adolescent can be mobile and be able to move around. The goal of osteosarcoma is to salvage the limb so there's something there for us to put a prosthesis on and giving them the ability to be mobile. They do surgery, of course, they do chemo and all of that. But the goal in this is let's, let's keep something there. Now, another tumor that looks sort of like a neuroblastoma, but um, a little different. Um, this is, I've seen one case in my life. It was a kid who came right after the Haiti earthquake. And this religious group brought him to the ER and all of the medical papers were in French, which I couldn't read. I'm like, so what's going on? They go, 
I don't know. They told me to bring them here, pick them up at the airport and bring them in. So I did an assessment. I did vital signs. I you know, did neuro checks. I listened to his lungs. I listened to his abdomen. And when I got to the left lower quadrant, I felt like a softball size hard mass. And for some reason, I knew it was a Wilms tumor. Now, how do we treat this thing? Well, number one, it is not, it's not tender, okay? It's, it doesn't hurt, all right? It's just there inside. And you'll do all of the analysis of, you know, ultrasounds or whatever we need to do. But these children, they'll do chemo and they'll do surgery. These are usually boys ages three to five African-American. So that's the Haitian boy that we saw. This child had the uh, chemo, had surgery, went back to Haiti and did very well. Remember these kids postoperatively, you have taken out a tumor which was on the kidney, okay? It's a kidney tumor. So the thing about this tumor, unlike all the other tumors we've heard of, is when you touch it, pieces can come off. It's very fragile. And those little pieces will go into the peritoneal cavity and metastasize. So big nursing thing, do not palpate the tumor, do not touch it, prevent you know anybody from touching that belly because it can break off cancer and keep it into the body, okay? The one thing as we do is I'll put a sign over the head of the bed and on the foot of the bed and sometimes on the kid's head, please don't touch that, that belly. These kids do great once it's removed, but we've touched the kidney. So postoperatively, we're going to make sure the kid's urinating. We have gone through the bowels to the back uh, of the body, which is where the kidneys are. So you worry about paralytic ileus and all that because of all that manipulation you've done. So monitor bowel function. And of course, big surgeries, you always look for infections. Rhabdomyosarcoma comes out of the ear, the eye. It is a soft tissue type of thing. And again, we'll just remove it. Retinoblastoma. Ever see an animal in the backyard and there's a light on your back porch and you see these shiny eyes, usually cats and dogs. Or somewhere else you might see deer and bear and all that. Well, it's the same thing. It's like the cat's eye sort of glow um, that we do see. And it's a tumor in the retina. And again, we're going to do a radiation and chemo. And you see that little purple mark that's on that child? That's something you're never going to wash off until they're done with radiation because that's where they point the zapper. So they want to keep it in the same place. They take out the eye because um, they have to get that whole retina and everything out. And usually they'll end up putting a prosthesis in the eye, you know, some sort of fake eyeball. And these kids do all right, you know, but again, they're going to be missing an eye. Now, testicular cancer, germ cell tumor. I've seen one bad one. 18-year-old boy comes in with testicular pain. When we examine him, his scrotum were huge and hard. We took an x-ray of his body and he already metastasized all over him. And then three months later, he died because he did not check his testicles like he should have. Liver tumors, take out the piece, leave the rest. They do really well. Quite uh, an incredible thing, liver tumors, but it's chemo and surgery. So survival, how do we do today? Well, survival rate is probably even more than 80% 80, 80 today. There's just so many advances that are going on with the chemos and the radiations and all of that stuff. So they're doing really well. So like many Facebook pages that you'll see as kids or adults holding up a sign, you know, in remission, I'm cancer free. And you now that's what all parents want for their kids. So pretty intense stuff, the cancer stuff.
that you lost connection. I guess. Yeah, all of a sudden I got kicked out. I apologize. Let's try that again. Yes, we worked. It looks like my game pin isn't working. Oh, there we go. I'm going to get going. Week six, pediatric hematology, immunology, and cancer. Which statement best describes a neuroblastoma? So that's the one that got tumor in the abdomen, and then it gets so big, it crosses the midline of the abdomen, right? And then you find the tumor in the head. <clears throat> Remember, diagnosis is usually after, you know, it's already metastasized. So outcomes are not as great. What is priority treatment for a newborn of an HIV positive mother? Remember I told you that these infants born HIV positive can become negative by one year. They What they call zero convert. And there's a lot of good treatments out there. So our goal is to improve that infant's immune system. Very much so. What are symptoms of sickle cell anemia? So your hand, foot swelling, pain, vision, delayed growth. I mean, could it be a little bit of everything? Well, maybe, but that one had the most uh, descriptive of all. Sickle cell anemia affects which cells? What blood cells does sickle cell work on? <clears throat> It's red blood cells. I always ask that question to make sure you know. Red blood cells, it carries oxygen and nutrients. And that's the big deal in sickle cell. What kind of a hematocrit was someone with sickle cell have and why? What did I tell you about these sickle-shaped cells? Yeah, they get stuck. It's some bifurcation of some vessel. But the hemoglobin are gonna be low because they die. Not there's less production, 
that's aplastic anemia. Lower uh, because they're dying quicker. What is the treatment for sickle cell anemia? And then I can ask you what's priority treatment? <laughs> So IV fluids, number one, expand that blood vessel and then antibiotics, blood, whatever else they need. But number one, you're going to give IV fluids and of course, pain medicines. What is the reason children with iron deficient anemia are easily tired? What's the basic concept? What is anemia? Whether it's iron deficient or B12, you know, they don't have the intrinsic factor what? No red blood cells, they're not carrying oxygen or nutrients, I'm gonna feel tired. Aplastic anemia includes a depression of which blood cells? I think it kicked me out. Okay. Just listen along. So when you think of aplastic, think of all of them, okay? RBCs, white cells, and platelets. You know, those are things, the body's just not giving you what you need. So again, they're going to treat it like a cancer and get blood transfusions. Most common type of anemia is what? Then I'll ask you, how are you going to treat this anemia? Iron deficient, we're going to give proper diet or we're going to give supplements. And remember the kid with liquid stuff in a straw. We don't want to stay in the teeth. What causes perniscuous anemia? I've mentioned it. Perniscuous anemia. What a word. <clears throat> Perniscuous anemia is the intrinsic factor, step B12. Good job. Which symptom is the single most common symptom of anemia? Usually brings them to the doctor. I mean, this has a really good picture of all of the symptoms. And it's that fatigue. There's no oxygen, there's no energy, there's no nutrition, I'm tired, I'm fatigued. When teaching parents about beta thalassemia, the nurse informs that the child is at risk for what? Remember, beta thalassemia is those rectangular shell shaped cells that burst. These are the Mediterranean are, are more at risk for this. And when your cells burst, what happens? You have chronic hypoxia. You have no cells. Nobody's carrying oxygen around. And inside the cells, oxygen, three inside. So we treat it with blood transfusions and some sort of iron chelation medication or therapy. What lab values will you see with hemophilia? <laughs> Well, we know there's going to be a missing factor. That's a given. What else do you see? <clears throat> so the PTTs prolong, just like being on heparin therapy. But the PT platelets are normal. And of course, you'll have a deficient factor. What priority treatment for a child with sickle cell crisis? Priority treatment. IV fluids, why? 
It's not pain medicine. That's treating a symptom. IV fluids dilate the vessels with heat. The sickle cell can go down and then the pain's going to decrease. Yes, I'm going to have pain medicine in my hand as I start the IV, but fluids will treat it why it happened. What is immune thrombocytopenia purpura? ITP. What did I tell you what P means in this? <clears throat> Decreased number of platelets. And you see petechial rashes and how do we treat it? IVIG and um, vitamin D. And also you have maybe corticosteroids. Of course, you're gonna watch out bleeding precautions also. Thrombocytopenia can cause the following symptoms. ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. It's called all different sort of names. But thrombocytopenia is decreased platelets in a nutshell. So you're going to see that rash, bruising. And again, the nosebleed might be the symptom. It makes you say, oh, it's ITP, and then we can treat it. A multi-select. A child with hemophilia has fallen, then he's swollen, painful. Treatment would include what? How did I tell you? to treat a joint that's filling up with blood because we don't want to destroy the joints. We want the joints to be maintained. So it's rice, we're gonna rest, ice, um, contain and elevate. And it's gonna be ice packs. We'll never put heat packs on these. No, no, no. Exercise, rest it, no bleeding. What is the priority nursing action for a suspected blood transfusion reaction? Spike to fever in 15 minutes to 102. What do you do? Turn it off. Make sure you go down to the hub and put on new tubing and call the doctor. See what he wants you to do for it. A child admitted with neutropenia, which nursing action takes priority. What is neutropenia? That's the question, right? And the answer is, it's a decreased white blood cell count, which means you don't have an immune system. So the first thing we're gonna do, hand washing. As simple as that. You don't need any precautions that. Hand washing, their white cell counts are low. We're gonna protect them. Hand washing is number one. What symptoms would a healthcare professional expect to see in a child with leukemia? I think this is exactly what the girl, my next door neighbor was. They said she was Korean, her name was Mig Young and her brother's name was Ku. I'll never forget them, they're good kids. Bruising, fatigue, bone pain, maybe a little fever. Your child has acute lymphocytic leukemia, has recent lab results, and has a platelet of 10,000. What are you going to do? Nursing action. I don't care if the kid has leukemia or anything else. You see a patient with a platelet count of 10,000. What is your priority? What does a platelet count of 10,000 mean? They're going to bleed, right? Platelets are needed for bleeding coagulopathy. Place them on bleeding precautions. No IM injections, no razors. Um, watching for bleeding everywhere. Soft toothbrush. A multi select. Child is placed on bleeding precautions for ITP. What interventions would the nurse do? So what do bleeding precautions on ITP? I went over that pretty clear. For ITP is lack of platelets and they do bleed and you'll see that petechial brush. 
So yeah, you're going to give the anti-D, the IVIG, and sometimes maybe corticosteroids. So yes, that is part of it. No injections, look for bleeding and watch a CBC with the platelet counts. Child with Wilms tumor, what action by a nursing student causes faculty member to intervene? <clears throat> Remember, this is a tumor on the kidney and it's fragile. You do not even do a biopsy of this to determine if it's cancer before surgery. We don't want to puncture it. So this child, if they're being palpating, leave that tumor alone. We don't want to spread cancer. Good. Cancer of the body's blood forming tissues, including the bone marrow, is called what? Cancer of the blood. It's leukemia, that's what it's called. A child with ALL has a fever of 100.5. What should they do? They're home, they take their fever. Temperature, they got a little low grade fever. What do we do? And why would we do that? Well, they have no immune system. Any kid with no immune system with a low grade fever needs to call their doctor, get medical attention. They'll either admit them or they'll give them IV, um, antibiotics to take, either or but they need to call the doctor. Child's having a bone marrow aspiration. Why should you tell the child? I mean, I'll never forget how you do these aspirations and you hear these crunch. It's like, oh, and you can see like the hand give as they're punching in. Remember, it's gonna hurt, but we'll do everything possible so it won't hurt that much. Most common clinical manifestation of a retinoblastoma. What is that called? And it's called a cat's eye reflex. Is that white something? Usually it's just one eye used to be when you took pictures with a flash. Your child's been diagnosed with retinoblastoma. What information is important? You know, sometimes we can look at the history, um, and, and information and it can help us treat these children. When it comes to a retinoblastoma, we want to know if there's been anything going on with that eye. We know whether it's tearing, pain, whatever, but that's all into that history. And that can help us treat these children. A goal of surgery for a child with an osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is cancer of the femur bone, right? But what's your goal for this surgery? I mean, yeah, we're gonna remove the femur bone, but we wanna salvage that limb. Where are we gonna put a prosthesis? It's just gonna be a hip joint. There's no place to put it. Keep these kids mobile. Immunizations cause autism, yes or no? Absolutely not. Good job. I mean, the physician who wrote that study actually got his license taken away. A child is complaining about skin markings for radiation should be told what? I told you that one about that um, cancer of the retina and that little purple marking that was there. What did I tell you about that thing? Leave it alone. That's where we know where to zap it. Very good. Sometimes I'll say, all right, let me put a mark on me too. And sometimes that's all the kid needs. We'll both have them. Multi-select. 
nursing care of a patient with immune thrombocytopenia purpura, ITP. What are we going to do? Well, P, platelets. What's happening to this kid? Okay, ITP is not anything to do with the blood vessels. We're all doing bleeding precautions. Oh, no IM injections, monitor blood counts, corticosteroids, maybe. We're going to give IVIG, anti D, but IV fluids is only for sickle cell. There's no need to dilate a vessel, there's no clogging of a vein, no IV fluids with ITP. When distraction is used, it helps what? I could say absolutely everything. <laughs> and that's the answer. The distraction helps with pain. It helps with a kid who's angry. It helps with so many things. What assessment question needs to be asked to a child with possible rheumatic fever? Giving you stuff from last week. I'll always throw some stuff in here. Remember, rheumatic fever is due to a strep throat that was undertreated. Treatment for rheumatic fever, everything will go away except for valve damage. And it's just giving antibiotics long-term, four to six weeks. Signs and symptoms of asthma. Remember, it's all of these prolonged expiration, uh, expiratory phase, right? That's expiratory wheezing, coughness, shorten of breath. Very good. Multi-select. What symptoms should be reported to a healthcare provider for a child with sickle cell disease? Like which one here is dangerous? So chest pain could be something in the heart and then headache could be a stroke, all right? Swelling of hands and feet is sort of normal. Sores, that's not sickle cell. Absolute contraindication for nasotracheal suction include which of the following? Again, from last week. You know, sometimes we want to get rid of phlegm, but we're just creating more inflammation, and we don't want to do that. So it's all of the above. Epiglottitis, croup, and tonsillectomy, you don't want it to start bleeding because they will hemorrhage big time. Iron dextran is given via which route? Let me take you back to pharmacology. So I am z track because it burns and it's, it really will stay in the skin. You know, the first injection I gave as a nursing student was a z track one. And can you imagine me as a student, first injection, an I am z track I was flipping out. Anyway, she told me I did good. <laughs> if a child was to receive their own bone marrow, this is called a blank transfusion. What was the trick in the words I taught you? Automatically mine should be first. Allergenic is all, everybody else. Very good. What cancer may present with pain, firm, and enlarged cervical nodes? A big swelling in the neck that we'll probably do a biopsy of. 
then we'll look for Sternberg Reed cells, Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's is those painless, firm, big cervical nodes. Non-Hodgkin's, they're just all over the place. They're, they, you don't see it like that. A multi-select. When teaching about sickle cell disease, you include what? <clears throat> I mean, we want to teach about how do we prevent sickle cell crises from occurring. Sickle cell crises occur when you are dehydrated or you have vessels that are restricted. So take the pain medicine early, dress warm. You don't want those vessels to constrict. And of course, any fever, get to the ER, get to the doctor. Thalassemia major is primarily treated with those big rectangular cells that burst and relieve, release the oxygen and it releases iron in the blood. And they don't reproduce that easily. And the answer is the blood transfusions. And remember, iron chelating therapy. I'll multi select. What are opportunistic infections of HIV? I mean, when you look at the opportunistic infections, we have respiratory, and then we have one that you know, it's just, you know, global kids of all ages. So PCP pneumonia and candida yeast, you know, it could be on the tongue or older women could be vaginal yeast. Those are the two big ones that you see a lot. A multi. Treatment of osteosarcoma includes osteosarcoma. Again, cancer of the femur, usually in those early adolescents. And what do we do? Well, we've already said what is our goal in treatment. And a stem cell transplant does nothing for this cancer. We need to take it out, I mean, amputate it or salvage it, and they put them on chemotherapy. The stem cell help. It does nothing. And multi. Who are the best donors for bone marrow transplantation? So I said donors. <clears throat> so if I have mine, oh, that's great. Or siblings, the all, everybody else, good. The other people, not as much. Those two, as I said, are the best ones to choose. What is the most common opportunistic for children with HIV? As PCP pneumonia. In fact, I found that out working as an agency nurse in this big county hospital. And all of a sudden I had an HIV patient who crashed and burned with PCP pneumonia and needed to be intubated. That's how I learned. How would you consider, what would you be considered to be neutropenic or a low neutrophil count? Remember neutrophil counts that are low, we're concerned. And these are our priority patients because they have no immune system. And remember, they should be over 1,000, 2,000. Less than 500, you're in trouble. Hand wash and treat that patient carefully. A primary characteristic brain tumor is... <clears throat> <laughs> Excuse me.
So what happens is symptoms, whether vomiting, headache, balance, it gets worse as it goes along, okay? You might start with a headache, start with vomiting, maybe you're a little unsteady, but it gets worse as it keeps going on. Getting worse needs to be investigated. The optimum treatment for osteosarcoma is what? I think we understand this now, don't we? Salvage that limb, okay? So yes, we're gonna remove the femur bone, but the optimum goal is to put that limb, salvage the lower part so that there's something to put a prosthesis on. And last question, a child's receiving the induction of chemotherapy. What does that mean? Remember, there's four different parts of it. We give a lot, then we get rid of what's ever there. And we go into maintenance. It's the initial intense chemo with a goal of remission. And then remember, they'll go into that part where they're going to find all those little cells they couldn't find and do that for a while. And then they're going to put them on some sort of prophylactic. Della, good job, Della. Number three, number two. Lisa, good job. Number one. Ooh, well, Kayla did it. Number four. Mia and Evelyn, good job, guys. All right, what I want you to do now is open up your modules, go to quiz number four. Remember, when you are done, the class is over. Anybody needs anything, wants to see me, um, send me a message and I will definitely be here for you. So you can start and you've heard every single answer this class. So good luck. Um, okay.